Holy Spirit says otherwise, next Sunday will uh, be the conclusion of this theme or talk, topic I've been sharing for several weeks now. From Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 2 and reading down to verse 5. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Consider him who endured such opposition from sin for men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. You may be seated. Fix your focus. Fix your focus. I shared with you when this series began several weeks back that Jesus' teachings centered around at least three things. He taught to get people's thinking to change. He taught to change their expectation. And he taught to change their vision. And I stated and repeat this morning that you'll never see anything happen in your life good until these three things begin to change your thinking, your expectation, and your vision. If you don't like the direction your life is going, it's real easy to change it. Why? Because you were created to be a visual being. Therefore, the very way you function as a human being has all to do with your vision or what your inner image is is and not only just with you being a human being but being a human being who's now living a life of Christ who lives on the inside your inner image is most important as it relates to the call of God on your life the processes that your life has taken and continues toward as well as the assignment that you have while here. The writer of Hebrews presents Jesus as the main and only character of this book. Uh, its theme is Jesus is better. Can we just put that into the atmosphere? Jesus is better. This is the theme of Hebrews chapter 12 or the entire book of Hebrews, Jesus is better. He's better than the law of the old covenant. Uh, he's better than Moses and the prophets. He's better than angels. He's just better altogether. Hebrews 1, 2 says, God who at sundry times, meaning in time past, and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. And then it uses that word hath, meaning he has spoken and continues to do so in these last days. In these last days, he speaks to us by his son. 
And it's important that you understand that God is not speaking to you by any other than his son. Jesus is the focal point. He's the author and the finisher of the believer's faith. The writer goes on to say he is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person, which means Jesus is the icon of God. And in everything relating to the believer's life centers around him. The key word in this text is the word looking, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. This word looking comes from a Greek word, uh, and, it, and it's a Greek word which means to look at and consider attentively. It literally means that you are to focus on Jesus and attentively consider everything about him. Why? Because he is the author and the finisher of the believer's faith. Apparently, the believers in Hebrews were experiencing tough times, extreme levels of frustration concerning many things. And I want to put a footnote here. Frustration is never the result of what's happening with you or what's happening around you. Frustration comes when you choose to live your life outside of the baseline of life. Uh, I've shared this example uh, a few times before and I'll share it again this morning. For instance, when when you start talking about frustration is a result of, of living and playing life outside of the baseline, you know, tennis is the only sport uh, that is designed for its players to keep the ball within the, uh, the baseline. Unlike uh, baseball or football, uh, when it comes to those sports, uh, someone is running with the ball or someone is running after the ball. But in the game of tennis, the players do not chase the ball. They, they pass the ball to one another uh, based upon the, the baseline. And if, if you were to play the game of tennis with me, I would recommend that you don't, but if you would decide to play the game of tennis with me and I knock the ball in serving it to you, I knock it outside of the baseline and you've got to run and get the ball, get back in position and then serve it back to me. You serve it to me uh, within the baseline and then I knock the ball back out of the baseline after some time of running after the ball, you're going to get frustrated. And you're going to decide to quit. Why? Because the game is not designed for you to chase the ball. The, that game is designed for its players to keep the ball within the baseline. What are you saying, Pastor Ford? I'm saying for many believers, uh, frustration is a result of you running and chasing in many ways exerting energy that you shouldn't have to exert simply trying to keep your life together. You, you're working up a sweat because you're not living by faith. You're living by, uh, and, and we do know that there is works associated with the believer's faith, but, but not the kind of work that causes you to sweat because you, you're living outside of uh, the baseline of God's word and you have forgotten that it is God who's begun this thing. He's the one who got it started and he's the one who's going to bring it to a flourishing end. Hallelujah. And so frustration occurs when your focus is placed on anything other than what God has called and anointed you to deal with. Now life will serve you all sorts of things. 
you will encounter on a daily basis all kinds of things, all kinds of interruptions in life. But you must know what you are anointed to deal with and you must know what he didn't anoint you to deal with. When you're trying to deal with those things that you have no anointing for, no grace to deal with, this is where frustration comes in. And whatever, whatever it is that God has called you to do, the writer of Hebrews says when he called you to do it, you didn't have to shed any blood for it. You didn't because... His blood was sufficient when your attention and consideration is anywhere other than where God wants it to be. You become frustrated at that place. And I repeat, your frustration is not with people or things that might occur at the time. It is the fact that you've lost focus of Jesus and how he wants you to respond to all of this. As long as you keep your focus on Jesus, you go, you're going to be okay. But when you look at your surroundings and judge them from your perspective, you will instantly become weary, irritated, and frustrated. Somebody ought to say, that's me. Frustration comes when you fail to consider Jesus. Looking unto him, the author and finisher of this thing. You know, you have to understand that before you recognized who you are in Christ, God had already thought about it in eternity past. He already made decisions regarding your life. He, 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 he had already begun before you got here what he intended to finish now that you are here. That's good news, people of God, that God will never get you into anything that you don't finish. And not that you finish, but that he will bring it to completion. He will bring it com to completion. God is not in the habit of starting it and not finishing it. So, again, frustration comes when you fail to consider Jesus when you fail to bring him into the equation. The text says, consider him who endured such opposition. This is so good for us as believers. The King James Version says contradiction or dispute or uh, disobedience or strife. The text says, uh, consider him who endured such level of opposition from sin for men. Why? Why should we consider Jesus and what he had to deal with on the cross and all that he dealt with the 33 and a half years he was in the earth and he dealt with it from sin for men. The text says, consider him. Why? So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. When you take your eyes away from Jesus and you begin to consider and focus on uh, what's going on in your life, what's going on with a particular situation or circumstance, when you take your eyes away from Jesus, I promise if you don't get back, you'll lose heart. You will tire out. You, you'll be at a point where you're ready to throw in the towel and just quit it all. There's a substance and deceit attack by the enemy upon many believers today. That attack, in, in a nutshell, is, is seen as extreme levels of frustration and ag aggravation. You can't serve God, nor can you serve others well, irritated, frustrated. So, so many times we are, we are, we are frustrated so much so that, that it has caused uh, many of us to lose our purpose, to forsake what we ought to be doing because we, we, we become weary with the opposition 
that we are faced with, you're not going to align your life with the will and the purpose of God for your life and get no opposition from your enemy. It's a fight, you guys. And the Bible says we're to fight the good fight of faith. Well, if, if it's a fight, the first thing we must consider about a fight is that there's going to be an opposing side. There is going to be something that's intended to work against you. But if God is for who? If God is for you, if, if, if angels are ministering spirits, anointed to aid you, if God be for you, what, who can be against you? Satan can pose the threat, but he cannot carry it out. He can form the weapon, but the weapon will not prosper. Many of you already know that. That's why you're sitting here this morning because all of what the enemy sent against you in the last couple of years, you are, you're not supposed to be here this morning. You're not supposed to be above the ground. But look at you. How did you make it? It was Jesus. It was Jesus. And the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, hallelujah, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. The enemy's strategy and device against most of us at this most important time in our lives is to keep us frustrated, to have us aggravated. And, and though we come to church and we do all of the, you know, those things that we've learned to do when we are present with our brothers and sisters, but we fail to do it, you know, when we are alone. See, worship can't be something you just do when you get here. That has to be one of your personal disciplines. Prayer and fasting. Uh-oh, I just said a bad word. Prayer and fasting. The, the, the disciplines of the believer's life. See, when, when the scripture teaches us not to be weary in well-doing, it's literally, literally saying it means don't get tired of doing what you know is right for you to do even if others are not doing what they should be doing. It's easy to become frustrated when you're doing all you know to do with the grace, somebody holler, with the grace. That grace means God gave you the ability. I'm telling you what, when you recognize that you got a grace to, to do it, even when you quit in your mind, the grace of God on the inside of you keeps you moving like that energizer bunny. You just keep on going. Your mind is saying, I'm going to quit, but your spirit says, I can't. It's easy to become frustrated when you're doing all you know to do. But your teammate seems to be doing none of what he or she could do to make it a little easier on you. But whether anyone helps you or not, you've got the grace of God. Grace means that you've been given the God kind of ability to stand up under it all, to go through it, and to keep going through it, 
and keep right on going through it. And every time you go through, you bounce back because there's a grace. Lord, have mercy. Some of you need to give God praise that you've got a grace on your life where you can't die in the middle of the battle. <laughs> you got to give God praise that you have a grace on your life to finish, to finish, to finish. God has given you a grace to do it, and you should be focused not on what's not going right. You must be focused on a grace that he's given you to do it. Whether you get accolades or not, whether others are encouraging or not encouraging, you've got to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. You've got to be your own motivator. You've got to be responsible for your own joy. You've got to take responsibility for your own peace. Stop waiting for people to make your situation peaceful when the peace of God is on the inside of you. You have a grace unlike anyone else. And you can deal with stuff. You have an endurance. Hallelujah. You just, you endure. I mean, it looks like sometimes for many of us, we're going down for the final count. And we're down there for a little while and the enemy is counting. And just as he's about to count the last count, hallelujah, the power that raised Jesus up and quickened his body. I came to prophesy to about 30 of you, there's a quickening spirit. There's a wind of God that's coming from the presence of God that will revitalize. It, it's going to renew you and restore you. Hallelujah. There's a wind God is about to blow on you. This is no time to be frustrated. This is not the time to be frustrated. This is a season where you must have expectation above any and everything else. So while others are not doing all they can do, and yet they are so critical of you, if you consider or focus on who's not doing what they should be doing too long, they can, without you even realizing it, shift your focus or hinder you from doing what you've always been doing with the grace of God upon you to do it. Some of you have just been doing it. Some, some of you, who are you? Where are you? You've just been doing it. You've been doing it. And you, you've been doing it when you felt like doing it. And you've been doing it when you didn't feel like doing it. You, you know, you just had that command uh, that, that God had given Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, every time I do it, I get in trouble. So I'm not going to do it anymore. But then Jeremiah found that there was a fire on the inside of him that was driving his life. Let me tell you what. You got to light your own fire nowadays. You can't wait for somebody to light a fire so you can be warmed by their fire. You've got to act and initiate a fire on the inside of you right in the midst of the greatest trial or trauma of your life you got to stand up in the midst of it and tell the devil I will bless the Lord at all times I will bless the Lord not I feel is there anybody in here who just made the decision that you will to bless him This is where the real frustration comes from. You, you must stop doing what's, what's right. Or you must not stop doing what's right for you. Although it's wrong for everybody else. You, you must not stop doing it the way he graced you to do it. I mean, you can get confused with the body of Christ. Because, you know, the body of Christ demands that you be a copycat. But you gotta, you got to come to a point where you understand I'm not made like that. 
I'm not criticizing how he made you, so leave me alone when it comes to the way he has made me. In fact, we're on the same team, guys. We're many members, but we one body, and uh, our God has given us diversity, but he gave us diversity and never intended that the diversity would bring division. Stop trying to control everybody else's life to get them to do it your way, to see it your way, because that's not the grace. That, that, that's not the grace. You got to deal with what God anointed you to do, and you got to drive the best you can in your lane. Now, now, let me balance that because the only time you should get in somebody else's lane is when you're there for support. See, sometimes you do have to get in someone else's lane because you want to be a source of encouragement because they're becoming weary at something you know God has anointed them to do. And so you bring a word of encouragement. You offer help. Don't criticize what I'm doing when you don't even have the grace to do it. And if I gave it to you, you'd make a mess of it because you don't have the grace. And for those of you who are walking in your grace, don't allow folk to push you into somebody else's grace because you don't have that on you. Don't tell me how to praise God. I'm loud. I've always been loud. And if you're not loud, I can respect that. If you can sit on your seat and just worship the Lord within, don't criticize me when I shout hallelujah. You don't want me to shout hallelujah on this row? You move because I ain't moving. Because every time I think of the goodness of the Lord, I'm going to shout hallelujah because praising God is always appropriate. And I may not praise God the way you do. But God accepts it all. Considering the way the church should do it, we can, we can so easily embrace traditions and religion. God is perfectly fine with the way he designed you. He likes everything about you. He likes the tone of your skin, every part of your anatomy, big, small, fat or tall. God loves you. We don't have to qualify for God. We already have. Jesus did that. Mm -hmm. Th this is where the real frustration comes from and I can tell and I'm not going to finish but I'll do the best I can you, you, you must stop you must stop letting what other people think about what God called you to do to steal your focus you will not be held accountable to God for anyone but you let me say to those who may not take this into consideration, let me say that as a believer, you are accountable to God and to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Especially when it comes to the things of God's word. Too often we lose focus on what's right for us. Notice I keep saying what's right for us to do by looking at the wrong that others are doing. When you so focus on what other people are doing that they should not be doing, you can lose a moment, an opportunity to focus on Jesus in such a way that it benefits someone else. Don't put a lot of focus on who receives you because they might receive you today and then tomorrow may not want anything to do with you. And, and sometimes that can, it can be so confusing, especially if you like me, when I enter into a relationship, 
I, I'm really there for the relationship. And I'm not always considering that some people want a relationship with me because they have material motives. They, they, they don't plan to go the distance that I'm going with them. They want something. They want something from me that if they ask God for and it's in his will, he'd give it to them. If the wrong someone else is doing takes your focus away from what God instructed you to do, then their wrong is no greater than yours at that point. When you're sitting around and you're aggravated that nobody's praising the Lord, and you're a praiser, but you decide you're not going to praise because you're agitated that everybody else isn't praising. Now you done missed an opportunity. You've got to take every moment, see it as an opportunity. Every second you breathe. Focus that breath on Jesus. Lord, I'm getting ready to breathe this breath. What should I be focused on? Because God didn't anoint you to breathe so you can do your thing. He anointed you to breathe so you could do his thing. <laughs> Luke 10, 38 through 42 there's a perfect illustration of, of how we can become so upset that others are not doing what we think they should be doing that we lose the vigor and excitement that we once had in doing what's always been right for us to do. My son Junior, bless his heart, he, he is in his relationship with the Lord. He's, he's uh, forbidding to eat certain kinds of foods and He's doing certain things, uh, fasting, and I, I, I uh, admonish him to continue. I celebrate that. But when he starts talking about all of what he ain't eating and that God got him on a 40-day fast, the Lord ain't said one thing to me. God ain't said nothing to me about a one-day fast. So I keep praying for his strength in the Lord. And I keep telling him, that's good. That's good, boy. That's good. That's good. Because God's doing something in him in this moment that God's placing that requirement on him. On him. When I get ready to eat, I eat. I say the blessing and I eat. You've got, you've got to get to the point where you're comfortable with what he has anointed you to be. I mean, really, really comfortable. I'm trying to encourage somebody. Because see, uh, you know, it's amazing how we can think we are comfortable and then someone can say one negative thing and it brings us out of focus what you got to realize is that when you really 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 doing what God wants you to do you're going to get all kind of question marks why are you doing that why are you doing that why are you doing that that's the indication that you ought to be doing it I don't want to be a follower unless I'm following Jesus in this hour and I want to follow him because there's somebody that's supposed to be following me We got to get rid of the spirit of Jezebel in God's house. When I was younger, the old saints thought Jezebel was uh, based on your clothing. And if that were the clay case, everybody today are Jezebels. This, the color suit I got on right now, back in my day, you couldn't be wearing this right here. Talking about you anointed, anointed where? If that suit won't black, gray, blue, brown, or white, and they all better be solid.
if we're going to go by that, we are all Jezebels, both men and women. But a Jezebel is someone who has the need to control somebody else's life. I'll never be a Jezebel. You know why? Because I'm too busy needing help to control my own life. I'm not going to be critical of what other people are getting wrong because I'm getting too much wrong in my process. And I don't measure people by me because I'm not the fullness. He is the fullness. Somebody holler at a neighbor and say, he's the fullness. Jesus is the fullness. He's the only one who gets it all right. So much so that God gave him preeminence. He's the only one who gets it all right. Thank God for grace that God gives for us to keep going until we get right. Luke 10, 38 through 42 tells the story of two sisters, Mary and Martha. Martha was anointed with the ministry of service. Jesus had been invited to their home for dinner. Apparently, while Martha was in the kitchen preparing the meal, Mary was at Jesus' feet listening as he ministered to her. In Luke 10, 40, it says, but Martha was distracted, meaning she lost focus. She was preoccupied. The, the, the Bible says she was preoccupied by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. In verse 41, Jesus replies, Martha, Martha. Martha has lost focus to the point that Jesus has to call her twice. You can always tell how far off you are from where you should be focused by how many times God's got to call your name. How many times God's got to get your attention. Mm-hmm. And Jesus said to her, you worried and upset about many things. What usually leads us to the one thing that has upset us are a lot of little things that really have, they have nothing at all to do with what we are assigned to do. Jesus went on to say, Martha, you, you're consumed with many things, but only one thing is needed. For, for you perfectionist saints, you're trying to get 20 things done and all God wants is one. Jesus esteemed Mary for remaining focused on the one thing. So often it's all the little things that upsets us and takes us away from the one thing that is needed. Mary had chosen, Jesus says, what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. What Martha was focused on was good, She's fixing the meal. But what Mary was so focused on was better. And Jesus said that couldn't be taken away from her. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Can I tell you that you can become so engrossed in the presence of the Lord that you forget you missed a natural meal? You do know the word will so nourish your spirit to the point that your natural doesn't recognize any desire for natural food. Try it sometimes. If you get in the presence of the Lord and the presence of God begins to minister to your spirit 
you come out of that presence full. If you're going to maintain what's necessary, you got to focus on Jesus. And if you're looking to him, you're looking away from everybody else and everything else. The question is, what are you looking at? Because when you lose sight of Jesus, you lose sight of everything. If you don't look at Jesus and make him your priority focus, there are things about his church, about your family, that can run you away from him. You must look at Jesus and take his perspective, his attitude about his church. I promise you, in today's times, you got to see the church through God's eyes. And, 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 and from my opinion, the church is in a bad way. But in God's opinion, whoo, his church is everything he declared it would be. Y'all, 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 it's a work in progress. Tell somebody I'm a work in progress. He's not. He, he, he's not. But he's, he's so uh, sure of his handiwork. His creation. He's so sure it's going to do what he put in it when he created it. Even if it takes some time. Some of y'all done forgot it took you some time. You, you kept beating your head against the wall. I mean, you plumb buddy and going right back to do the same thing just as soon as you can. And, and God was long-suffering. God was long-suffering. Hallelujah. God was long-suffering. Could have killed you. Hallelujah. But because he understood, I put the grace in it. I put the grace, grace in her. She ain't got it yet, but if she continues on, she's going to come to what I called, anointed, and declared she would be. You must take his perspective of the church and others. If God, if God haven't done anything about some things, it's his prerogative. It's, how are y'all going to be bothered trying to control what's only in God's control? I mean, you can talk until you're blue in the face. That child is under God's control and you got to know that you got to know you laid the foundations and whatever that child might be doing you have to know that that child is in the hands of God why because you put them there when they were babies you gave that child to God and if that child is in the Lord's hand God will permit certain processes, but thank God at the end of it, the child will live and the child will eventually come to its destiny or his or her destiny. Peter, see you, Isaiah 55, 5, his ways and his timings are not ours. His thoughts and our thoughts are not the same. Mm-hmm. And that's what's got most believers in trouble. We are proud of our thinking ability. And that is dangerous when it's not yielded to, to God. He did anoint you to think. But if you allow the wrong perspective to intrude, then you'll be relying on what you think is right. And there's a way that seemeth right. I said it seems right. But it ends in destruction. Why? Because it was your thought and not God's thought. That's why we get so frustrated. We go do things for people they didn't even ask for, and now we upset because they ain't happy about it. They didn't ask for that. In your mind, you wanted them to have it. So Peter described that 
Peter described that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So if God says, I'll see you tomorrow, you could be waiting a long time because he's outside of time. Please tell somebody God considers his own thoughts. He considers his own, he, his focus is on what he's thinking and what he's planning. So God spoke these words through the prophet Isaiah. He says, I am God and there's none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I'll do all that I please. This is God's way of saying his purposes are utterly fixed and cannot be changed by any action of yours or others. Let me get back to frustration, then I'll, I'll close. I think it's safe to say much of our frustrations are a result of the fact that we can't change God's plans, his purposes. That, that's where frustration comes when you're working against God's plan. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Listen to Romans 9, 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. There's a purpose for everything. God purposed to harden Pharaoh's heart. But prior to that, he had just told Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Isn't it amazing how God can tell you to do something and it seems like he allows so much to get in the way of what he told you. Sometimes I'm thinking, God, I, I, I will to obey you. Now, I, when I first heard God say do it, I was ready to do it. But I don't think I would have been so ready if he had shown me all of the obstacles, all of the opposing things on my way. Y'all hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, God, God will tell you that that it's going to end well and won't tell you nothing about the process. That's a walk of faith. He'll tell you, I'm going to make you great. And we start getting happy about being great because we don't understand how great the process will be in order to come to that level of greatness. We don't understand the sacrifices that come with being great. Okay. There's a purpose for everything. There's a purpose for the mosquito, a purpose for the fly, there's a purpose for the ant, there's a purpose for, for lice, there's a purpose for the snake, there's a purpose for the roach, there's a purpose for the maggot, there's a purpose for the flower, there's a purpose for the bumblebee, there's a purpose for the hair in your nose, there's a purpose for the hair upon your, uh, under your arm. Nothing in life is without a purpose. I don't know what God was thinking of when he created the possum. And now some, some folks are adopting them as pets. Possums. I can be riding at night and when I'm in the middle of the road and I want to get out and let them drive the car. They're the ugliest creatures I've ever seen. And don't let me run over one of them. And yet, God has a purpose. Has a purpose for the skunk. Nothing in life is without a purpose. I'm trying to help us. Frustration always occurs when we attempt to eliminate something we don't like or something we don't, we don't want because we can't change it. The reason why we kill rats, mice, 
is because we don't know their purpose. The reason we kill roaches is because we really don't know their purpose. I do know that there is no purpose for them in my house. I do know that. I do know if I find one in my house, I'm calling the exterminator. Because more than likely, if there's one, there's more. <laughs> We're wondering why the animal kingdom is now invading us. Because we've moved into their territory. We're building houses where they used to live. Millions of animals have been killed off because man did not know their purpose until it was too late. Scientists are trying now to rebalance the animal kingdom because man has killed off animals that God created for specific purposes. When you look at Jesus, he reveals the Father's plan, his plans and his purposes. The text says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, of our faith. And it goes on to say, for, for, uh, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You know why Jesus stuck with crucifixion? He stuck with crucifixion because while crucifixion was terrifying to the physical him, it was bringing him joy. Because while he was being crucified, he was also giving birth to you and I. I can tell you that if you change your focus and stop looking at the travailing pain that's associated and get your focus on what you're getting ready to birth, if you just get really excited about this new season of your life, I promise you this new season will, will help make sense of all the other seasons. Can I tell you that God's going to bless you so good that you're going to forget about some of the past seasons. Some, some of y'all need to just go on and get ahead of it and start blessing the Lord right now before it actually manifests because you know you've already faced the worst of it. There isn't anything left but the best of it. Your heart has already been broken to the point that, you know, it's going to take God to completely repair it. You've already been disappointed. And that's why God says, I'm not a man that I should lie or the son of man that I should, should repent. What God is saying, he said, you guys are looking at me like men. You've had men and women to lie to you. You've had men and women to let you down. You've had family members who forsook you and here you're looking at me like you look at them. But I'm not a man. I'm not in their category. I'm not a man that I should promise you and not bring it to pass. Nor am I the son of man that I'll ever have to repent because I didn't do what I said. I'm not a man. Somebody praise God that he ain't like everybody else. He will not disappoint you. He will not fail to provide for you. He will not fail to deliver you and to fight for you and bring you to an acceptable and appointed place for your life. I don't care what the last two years have brought into your life, what you've had to face since the last two years. I came to tell you that if you look to Jesus, the author and finisher Jesus endured the contradiction he endured everything that was associated with crucifixion he, 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 he endured the rejection 
the mockery. He endured the pain, the suffering. Oh, and he showed us on the cross how to endure whatever it is we got going on in our lives. We can endure. Will you help me prophesy? Tell two people, you will not die in it. You will not die in it, but you will overcome it. Somebody said a few weeks back, you're not just going to exist. You're going to be more than a conqueror. you coming out of this with the victory. Why? Because we have someone who showed us how to do it. Hallelujah. He showed us how to wait. He has shown us how uh, to be diligent in all things. He's shown us how to do it the Father's way and to glorify him. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. We get so tired up in focusing on the process until we forget there's an end. It, what you're dealing with is not going to be forever. There's an end. Whoa. There's an end. There's an end. Somebody holler, tell your neighbor, consider the end of it. Consider the end. Consider it, Job. Consider it, Job, because you lost everything uh, doing the process, but when you get to the end of it, I'm going to double you. <laughs> Somebody holler and tell your neighbor, look at the end of it. You're looking at what you're in presently. You're looking at how it's going right now, but I promise you, if you look to Jesus... They put him on a cross and uh, thought that they would kill him. But three days later, in fact, he says, they didn't kill me. I laid my life down. And because I've got power to lay it down, I've got power to pick it up again. You need to tell your spirit, it's time to pick you up. Tell your spirit it's time to come out of this. It's time to overcome what you've been looking at, what you've been thinking about. It's time for a refreshing from the presence of the Lord. It's time for you to be motivated to get up and keep on going because eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. It has not entered into your heart the things that God has prepared for you but I did double dare you to go and praise him before you can see it praise him before they manifest give him glory before he does it because you already know he's not a God that he should lie hallelujah Take a moment and look back at what you've already made it through. Look back. Look back. Did, did he not come through for you? Look back. When the doctors said to you, this is all we can do. This is far as we can go. Look back. Because the real doctor stepped into your room and healed your body. Ha, ah, somebody giving praise. All you got to do to get your spiritual adrenaline to move is to just go back and begin to remember what the Lord did. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. If he did it then, he'll do it again. says I'm finished the principalities of darkness they got happy because they thought crucifixion had fixed Jesus forever 
But what they did not know, that in the mind of God, you do understand Jesus did it all for, for his father. That's why you and I got to do it for him. They, principalities of darkness, they were saying, we got him now. We got him now. We got him now. But in the mind of God, God says, I got something in my mind. I want to enlarge my family. I want a bigger family. And I ain't got but one right now. The only begotten. And I'm going to take my only begotten and I'm going to put him on a tree. And I'm going to let the devil think that he's killed my child. But in three days, he's going to get up again. And this time, he ain't getting up by himself. Bertha Clark is getting up with him. Y'all ain't saying nothing. William T. Ford is getting up with him. Charles Peel is getting up with him. Y'all better not mess with me. Uh, Brother Anthony, he's getting up with him. Uh, Reggie in it got up with him. Put your hands on yourself and tell yourself, I got up when he got up. Yes, I said you got up when he got up. And you are his, his risen anointed one. Look around here. Y'all look all around here. Now let me tell you, when you look around this room, you have nothing but examples of overcomers. That, that's why, watch this now. Watch this. See, I can't see you for what you're worth just sitting at home watching you on a, a TV set. Or on a tablet but when I get in your presence and I hear your testimony the stuff you've been through and see we think we're the only ones who have been going through something everybody in this place this morning has a testimony of the goodness of the Lord and and they are incredible testimonies not any of us should be here this morning but thank God for the resurrection power that got you up that's got you going come on celebrate that I'm finished looking unto him come on looking how did Jesus relate crucifixion how did he relate to crucifixion he resurrected crucifixion is nothing more than an opportunity to be resurrected a down for believers ain't nothing but a up the next time around Lord have mercy I just told some of y'all you've been down but the next the next step in your life is up 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 God's getting ready to exalt you, elevate you, increase you. He's getting ready to bless you beyond measure. He's about to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon you and your family that you have not even the room to receive. He's about to make you the head and not the tail. Y'all ain't heard hearing from me. He's going to make your face like flint and cause you to stand upon your high places. Somebody give him praise. Yes, somebody give him praise. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Thank you, God. Let's celebrate him right now. Just take this moment and just celebrate him. Get in your mind in this moment some wonderful thing that God has done. And just celebrate him. Since I recovered from COVID, I've continued. I went back to what I was doing. At that time, I was walking maybe five, six, uh, six miles a day. But the other day, I looked down, and I had walked nine miles. 
And immediately my mind went to months back where I couldn't walk to the bathroom. I couldn't take two steps. And on several occasions on my way to the restroom, I fell on the floor and had to lie there until I could get my breath. But I looked down at my watch and I, I walked nine miles with no difficulty in breathing. Nine miles hadn't even felt it, didn't feel like I had walked nine miles. And when I saw it, before I could get myself together, I was all tore up right out there by myself. I had to go to a tree and lean on it and begin to bless God for his goodness and his mercy. I had to give him thanks for what he's already done. I had church without an organist. I had church without all of you. I had church in that moment when I began to think of the goodness of Jesus. honor the Lord with a, a prayer of praise. Father, we just thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. You are so good. You are great. And greatly to be praised. You're worthy of our praise, our adoration. Our worship belongs only to you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the example that we have with him of your faithfulness. You didn't spare your own son. He did not avoid anything that he faced on earth. He faced those things and overcame those things because of his faith in you, his Father. So now we just praise you that Jesus the Christ lives in us. We're motivated by him. Our joy is complete in him. Your promises are fulfilled through him. Thank you right now that we're more than conquerors because he strengthens us. Thank you right now that you're bringing us to that destiny, that place you ordained for us to be. Forgive us for every time we lost focus because we were looking at somebody else instead of looking at Jesus. Father, forgive us for every level of immaturity that we've responded to in the process of what ended to be the best things that have ever happened to us. Lord, some of the worst things that we thought were the worst things has ended up to be some of the best things that could ever happen things you brought us through that if we had not had the experience we would not know you at the level we now know you oh God we just bless you for all you blessed us to be we bless you you good thank you for the house that we live in and the car 
that we drive for the for the account the, the accounts the bank accounts that, that we have to thank you God that that we have the activity of the activities of our limbs thank you God that he, with some of us we need healing but thank you because you are the God that healeth us and we're confessing that even now we are healed regardless of what it's looking like and feeling like regardless of what the x-rays show or what the doctors are saying we give you praise that we are healed by Jesus' stripes we look to him he is the God that healeth us and we decree and declare our healing right now in the name of the Lord Jesus somebody need to just receive that right now by faith count yourself healed count yourself healed completely count yourself having been made whole by the blood of Jesus Jesus Christ. Come on, believers, and praise him for your healing. Praise him for your turnaround. Praise him for your breakthrough. We honor you and we bless you now. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. 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 Elder, in it, will you please come and just give our invitation? While he's coming, come on, bless the Lord. Did this word bless you? Did this word bless you?